Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to episode number 100 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. The Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting. Hear from knife designers, knife makers, manufacturers, knife reviewers, anybody who loves knives, you are in the right place, and you are especially in the right place for Clap Time Party Celebration. Woohoo! Episode number 100 of the podcast, Bob. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Episode 100. 100. Jim, I don't think I've done 100 of anything. Uh, I've had a hundred consecutive lunches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. I never miss like a meal. <laughs> but no, yeah, this uh, you know something like this. No, it's 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 tough to be consistent. It is, but uh, man, this past year and change has been awesome. I've had an opportunity to talk with knife heroes and just people I've always wanted to meet. People I've been watching on YouTube. People whose knives I've been buying and. Or, or just uh, drooling over online. Wanting to buy. <laughs> yeah, wanting to buy. And the, the funny thing is, and I, I don't know if I set this up subconsciously as a justification for future purchases, but it seems like everyone I talk to uh, on the podcast, after I hang up with them and the interview's done, I'm like, man, I got to get one of their knives. I got to figure out how right. to get one of their knives. And uh, I would say maybe I made that come to pass maybe 50% of the time, roughly. Right, yeah. right. Well, a uh, little tip then for knife makers out there. If you haven't yet been on the podcast, you may want to get on if you want to sell a knife to Bob. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the podcast started November 5th, 2018. It used to be weekly. Uh, we were uh, You were interviewing uh, knife makers, reviewers, manufacturers, all that. And there was just so much information to try to get into the, to the hour show. We typically try to keep it at an hour. Uh, and there was other things you wanted to uh, to get into, so we we added the midweek supplement. Yeah, well, it's very generous the way you say. There's so much information to cover. <laughs> I think really what it is, and it comes down to a verb we've used a lot here, is bloviating. To bloviate and uh, to talk at length about a subject, and uh, you know sometimes you just like to get going about that new knife you have coming in, or uh, you know I like to rattle off the knife drops as I see them on Knife News and Knife Magazine, and those were not really fitting in well with the interview show. I, I, I have a feeling, just as a podcast consumer myself, that when, I, when I'm when i tuning in to hear an interview with, say, Ernest Emerson, I don't want to hear Bob DeMarco talking about his new knife. I just right. want to hear about Ernest. I want to hear Ernest Emerson in right. his own words. So, uh, so we broke it out into that supplemental show that we put out on Wednesdays. And the thing I love about that show is that it's totally free form. Some days it's just knife drops. Uh, other days we do a, a first tool, you know, where where I talk about the history of a certain design right, or something. Right. And and that's just a an investigation. I, I am no academic. Let me put it that way. It's just out of personal interest. I, I kind of look like the Chris recently, you know, um, Cold Steel has come out with two folding Chris's and that's an unusual blade and a difficult one to make and probably a difficult one to uh, mass produce. And it, it made me interested in what the actual history was of it. I had a few facts kind of rattling loosely around the brain about it, looked into it, and then got a first tool out of it. So I, I like those. Uh, I like the supplemental because it's just an opportunity to sort of freeform uh, talk about knives like I just did in right. 60 seconds. <laughs> well, and, you know, it was kind of an experiment. And, you know, I think we're both pleasantly pleased and surprised by the the number of listeners that the the midweek show gets and that uh, mm. folks like it, you know, it, almost equally as much as the interview show. So, uh, I, you know, we will continue doing the midweek and uh, always welcome, of course, feedback, suggestions, things that uh, people would like to see. But uh, good opportunity to uh, do some extra knife talking, which I know you and uh, the more folks in the knife world that I've come to know uh, enjoy talking about knives. And it's not yeah. just to hear themselves talk. it's to really talk about the knives. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. You know, you get enthusiasts about anything together. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you can talk about a sidekick all night with a bunch of martial arts guys. Right. And, uh, you know, not get bored. 
Well, uh, we teased it last week, I think, episode number 100, where we're going to have a special announcement or maybe two or three or whatever. What, what We would just see what kind of came about. And uh, we do have a couple of special announcements as well as a special guest on this show that mm-hmm. we'll, uh, we'll keep that guest uh, uh, silent for the moment. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll tease a couple of the other special things that uh, Bob has put together for special episode number 100 of the Knife Junkie podcast. And one of those special things that we're doing to celebrate is a knife giveaway, Bob. Yes, indeed. You know, I wanted to give away a knife uh, to celebrate this 100th episode, and I was racking my brain. There are a lot of, obviously, great knives out there, a lot of ones that I love, and a lot of people I've interviewed on this show that I'd love to, you know, I'd love to give away a Medford or an Emerson. That's not going to happen. However... (laughs) If you were, I'd be glad to take one. (laughs) Uh, However, I am going to give away a knife that has a special meaning to me, and if people have been, uh, you know, listening or watching the videos over the past couple of years, you know that I'm a big fan of the Cold Steel Broken Skull. It is a uh, very thin, very capable, uh, nicely sized clip point blade, and it is now um, discontinued. Uh, But it's got all of the strength of the triad lock in a very super slender package, uh, as I've mentioned ad nauseum here. Uh, I I keep one in my waistband kind of all the time, and, uh, you know, when I'm wearing clothes pants that is uh, <laughs> oh that's and, i can't get that visual out of my head you without pants with a knife i mean you know not in jammies or sweatpants okay. and uh and and it's got to have a snaggle tooth mf on it so but so i'm going to give away a broken steel uh broken a uh, cold steel broken skull with a snaggle tooth mf on it uh for this 100th giveaway it will not be a pink cold steel broken skull now I was going to say, you're not giving away your pink one, are you? No, not my pink one. And as people know, you know, I'm I, I'm a big fan of that knife for its cognitive dissonance. And I I have to say, I like pink next to black. It's It has to do with having daughters, I think. But uh, so I like that knife. And uh, Rob Penna from Snaggletooth sent me a uh, sent me a pink Snaggletooth MF. So, I mean, my setup is awesome. But I'm not going to make someone else carry pink just because I like pink. So I'm going to send, it's OD green, broken skull, uh, uh, and uh, it will have a snaggle tooth MF on it. Hmm. Okay. So now. So, well, I was going to ask, how how can folks enter to win or how can they get a chance to win this? Well, all you have to do, because I I don't have a complex mind for this kind of contest. (laughs) We're going to make it simple. All you have to do is email me, uh, bob at thenifejunkie.com. And in the subject line, write episode 100 hmm. okay. so, that, so that we know. And uh, and then you can write me a nice little message or not, but your email will be put uh, will be uh, put in a bin in order, and then that will be fed into a random number generator in one week. So all they have to do is get that into me by midnight. Uh, that's at uh, Saturday, April 11th at midnight. Uh, Bob at thenifejunkie.com. Uh, episode 100 in the subject line, you'll be put in order and in a number generator. And whoever that lucky person is will be announced on the show. And uh, I will be sending a broken skull out to you. And, um, you know, uh, so far, postage is still uh, working fine. So I'll send it with a with a little wipe in it for you. Don't make promises you can't keep, Bob. Those I wipes think, are hard to come by. <laughs> I think that's good etiquette in, in this day and age, you mm-hmm. know. You, you send a knife to someone. You put a little alcohol wipe so they can be, so they can open it up and be sure that. Uh, yeah, we're we're uh, uh, particular. At least my wife is particular around the house now. Whenever we get the UPS packages or those things coming in, you know, we can't set it on the kitchen table like we used to. Yeah, you know, we have the uh, foyer table. That's where we set all the packages and you know put gloves on when we open it. I'm like, you know, are we really getting too paranoid about this? I, you know, I don't think so, but. I, it, sometimes I wonder if we are. I don't know. Well, it's because this whole situation is so surreal. It's like sometimes it's like, is this really happening? I have those moments. Uh, but, you know, you have those moments when you have weird things going on. Right. All right. So, again, to reiterate, uh, Saturday, April 11th by midnight, you need to get your email in to bob at com and put in the subject line episode 100 that way, Bob will know you're uh, sending your email in to enter this 
drawing for a free broken skull cold steel with the Snaggletooth MF uh, attachment, if you will. And uh, we will uh, announce the winner on next week's show, which will be episode number 102. So uh, get that entry in and uh, good luck in advance. Hope you win. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Also to celebrate, Bob, we're going to do or you're going to do a little something special on video as well. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it's going to be Saturday, April 18th at noon. We are going to have a uh, we're going to have a gathering online of people that we've interviewed and people, friends of the show, and we're going to have an online knife hang. It will be kind of mm. like it will be kind of like a, uh, a knife gathering that you might find in your local area. People uh, linking up on Blade Forums or on uh, USN, getting together in their localities to show off knives. Well, we're going to do that here on the Knife Junkie podcast, but it's going to be a, a live stream uh, on YouTube. Live video. Yeah. Live video on YouTube noon on saturday uh, april 18th all right cool that and, sounds uh, fun yeah it's it will be cool and it's a chance to hang out meet some of the people we're going to have a couple of very special guests coming in uh we'll have a chance to uh hear from them briefly and then uh, also it's a chance for us all to show off our knives uh we'll have i'm sure alex will will join us uh maybe slicey dicey some of the some of zell some of the zell, friends of the show yeah, you know yeah. Well, and I was going to say, and uh, the show, uh, like our Thursday Night Knives show, will also be open to anyone that wants to uh, to pop in, maybe yeah. show off a special knife, just say hi, or have a quick conversation. Uh, we have that capability to uh, bring folks on to the to the live video chat and live video hangout. So all you need is a webcam and a and a you know a microphone, the webcam mic or whatever, and uh, you can actually join in the show as well. Yeah, how cool is that? Jim will float you in on screen. We'll have a chance to meet, have a chance to talk, show off our knives a little bit, and then someone else will come to the door. It'll be, uh, I'm calling it a gathering of eagles. That's my code word for it, Jim. <laughs> okay. Mr. Uh, Super Spy there. <laughs> well, as we're all practicing our social distancing, this is uh, one way to get together, be face-to-face, have a conversation, but uh, definitely we'll have that social distancing in place since it's all done by remote video. So Saturday, April 18th at noon, the Knife Junkies live video hangout. Uh, it'll be until until we finish all the guests we have or folks that want to join in. So there's no uh, scheduled end time. It'll just be a fun time to hang out on a Saturday afternoon. And we hope you'll uh, go ahead and put that on your calendar. If you have any questions or uh, you'd like to uh, join in or whatever, Shoot Bob an email at bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our listener line at 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487, and uh, give us any thoughts or feedback. All right, Bob, as we mentioned, we're celebrating episode number 100 today of the Knife Junkie podcast, mm-hmm. and uh, I was kind of surprised when I kind of quickly looked at some, some statistics right before we started recording today. Almost at 40,000 downloads. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, just on the podcast statistics. That's not counting listens on YouTube, which we put all the podcast up on YouTube. And I know a lot of folks like to air quote watch it on YouTube, you know, mm-hmm. just have the, the video going and hear the podcast in the background as they're doing other stuff. So uh, I'm thinking we're, we're at 40,000 already, if not well over with, with the YouTube numbers added in. So just incredible. I, I love it. I'll take that number. I, I just uh, I'm flattered that anyone would would pay attention, you know, and, right. and, and I know a big part of it is that we we managed to land some pretty awesome guests on the show. Not to not to toot our own horn, but I, I know people are tuning in to, to hear from these people. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they they like us just fine. But really, they want to hear it from from these makers and these reviewers and such. Well, and that was the uh, the goal of the podcast when we started was to uh, mm-hmm. try to, you know, bring the knife community together, talk knives, have everybody uh, be able to share their thoughts, their opinions, feature and highlight knife makers, manufacturers, or viewers, that kind of thing. And uh, I think you've done a great job getting all these folks scheduled over the uh, the course of over almost a year and a half and uh, still a lot more folks to, oh, to yeah. talk to, man. I don't think we're ever going to run out of guests. I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, just think of anyone, anyone who's listening, think of anyone that you would want to hear from. And I've probably sent them an email <laughs> and, and you know, a couple. And I understand people are busy or, pe- you know, old emails get out there or maybe I don't have the right email or whatever. Uh, but uh, 
I just keep sending them out, and and that's how that's how some of the guests. Came. Oh, I didn't see this. Right. You know. Oh, I sent it four times, but I'm right. glad you saw it right. this time. So I just saw the fourth one. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, if you uh, if you do have uh, a knife maker, knife uh, manufacturer, knife friend, somebody making knives in their in their basement, we'd love to talk to them. Uh, uh, again, shoot Bob an email at bob at thenifejunkie dot com or call the listener line at seven two four four six six four four eight seven with any guest suggestions you may have. Or honestly, Bob, any uh, critiques or feedback they have on the podcast, we're always looking to improve and try to get better. So uh, if you know if you have some. Uh, constructive criticism we'd like to hear it yeah yeah just so everyone knows i went to art school i can take it that's a whole <laughs> half of what you do is hear people lambast your work so <laughs> well and all the uh, all the compliments go to me and all the bo- uh, criticism go to bob because i i can't handle it now, who's the guy with the radio <laughs> voice yeah he's cool that would, that would be bob no all right a lot of good stuff we're trying to do here on episode number 100 and we've uh we've purposely held off the special guest because it's a guest who has not been on the podcast before as a guest. But this person has been on the podcast before every time. <laughs> so does that narrow it down, Bob? Do, do, do you, I think I said too much about who our guest today is? I, I don't know, but I have a feeling that he's brilliant and handsome and just a wonderful person overall. So oh, you're inter- you're interviewing me? <laughs> Jim, how you doing? <laughs> hey, no. Seriously, we are interviewing Bob today. Or I am interviewing Bob today. It's kind of a a, a flip. Bob is used to being on the other side of the mic asking mm-hmm. questions today. I'm going to be asking the questions of Bob and we chatted about this several weeks ago and we were thinking, you know, who would be great to have on episode number 100? Every one of our guests would be appropriate for a 100 celebratory podcast but we decided that you know even though you have gotten a chance to learn a little bit about bob from the podcast and from the thursday night knives video show and his youtube channel it'd be a good opportunity to learn a little bit more about the knife junkie so that's what we're going to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So you're ready for the grilling? Yes, let's get it. And and people might not know this about Jim because he's uh, Jim is a magnificent interviewer in his own right. I produce a number of podcasts that he does, and he is an outstanding interview. So I'm I'm excited to mm. be interviewed by you, sir. Now I am scared. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I don't let you down, and you, listener, as well. But anyway, um, Knife Junkie Podcast. How did this come about, Bob? This idea of, of talking knives. Well, Jim, uh, you were a huge uh, progenitor of this, um, you know, at work. You know, you and I, as Jim and I work in the same place and uh, our jobs intersect uh, at podcasting. And I have produced many, many a podcast for him over the years. And in the uh, hours and minutes between those podcasts, when we've just been talking about personal stuff, you know, you always mentioned uh, that you noticed my love of knives, my obsession with knives, and and that uh, I should do videos. This was back in 2013. You told me I should do videos. I'm like, no one wants to watch my videos. I I just like to watch other people's videos. But I started to make some then because you suggested it, and uh, they were pretty good. But I did not have. Um, I, I talked for too long, and <laughs> I wasn't consistent. Shocker! <laughs> <laughs> As I am right now, I wasn't consistent. Uh, I didn't have a schedule. And now, now this was something that you have shown me, uh, time and time again, because I, I veer towards the, uh, chaotic and, and less scheduled just by temperament. Uh, and you have a more regiment, a regimented sort of outlook. And you sort of showed me that when you do something like this, like a podcast or a video, uh, channel on YouTube, you have to be regular. And being a podcast listener myself, if I don't hear my podcast that I like coming out with regularity, I start to panic. Not panic, but it's like, God damn it, what am I going to listen to now? And, and, uh, you know, I want to check in with this person and and see what's happening, who they're talking to next. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you suggested we do a podcast. I don't know if you remember this, but you you have this special interest and I, and now I'm speaking as you, I have this special interest in actually producing podcasts, but also kind of cross-platform, um, I don't want to say marketing, cross-platform exposure of content. Mm-hmm. So when your interest met my interest, it it just seems like uh, uh, the perfect 
sort of marriage because I don't have um, necessarily the same interest that you have and you don't have necessarily the same intensity of interest in, in right. the knife thing. I remember that lunch well over a couple of slices of pizza. Yeah. Yeah. At, at my favorite pizza place that you just don't seem to like, which is odd. But Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the last name's DeMarco. Who are you going to trust in this conversation? True. True. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so, yeah, Jim, it was it was you. And, and then, uh, uh, but I was like, no, no podcast. How many podcasts are we going to be able to come up with? And then I was, uh, I was driving. I had to run an errand into D.C. one day, and I was driving back. And I decided to check out a podcast that I had heard mentioned on the Joe Rogan podcast. It's a science podcast. I won't mention it here, but I love it now. But I turned it on. I thought the two guys were total dorks. And I was like, oh, my God, if these guys are doing it, Jim and I can nail it. <laughs> so I called you from the car right there as I was listening to this uh, episode of this podcast that I now love. And I said, Jim, I think we can do it. I'm listening to two guys who are such mamalukes. I think you and I can do it. <laughs> and and that's when we started. Two mamalukes talking knives. That's right. Right. <laughs> So, what was the purpose, though, of this podcast? What did you want to happen or come from having a a weekly and now twice weekly podcast about knives? Yeah, I I really wanted um, to get myself in a position where I could speak to um, the people whose knives I was buying, you know, and I had seen enough in terms of interviews on YouTube and 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 uh and such to know that these are interesting people and uh, people who devote their lives including their livelihood to knives to me is interesting because that is always a step that uh that has seemed unrealistic in my own life but something i've wanted to do man oh, how awesome would, would it be if you know from from dawn to dusk my whole day was about knives in one way or another you know making them of course i'm i'm a, i'm a handy guy and i went to art school so for me, it's always been kind of the idea of eventually having some way to to produce a number of knives so I could sell them. I I, I mess around in my own shop here, and right. uh, I'm inconsistent with that. Lately, I've been doing it a lot, um, but you know, it, it, I am no career knife maker, but I'm fascinated by those who are. And um, mm. so, just to kind of get to meet these people and talk to them, see where they come from. And uh, inject myself into that world a little bit. I know that sounds a little self-serving, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to be part of it. Be part of the knife world. So what have you learned now over 99 episodes and the, the recent Thursday Night Knives video shows that uh, that you've added into your repertoire of uh, products? Uh, what, what have you learned? Uh, well, I think that uh, it takes an extraordinary – okay, so, you know, I've, I've mentioned a couple of times even in this podcast how I – I have an art school upbringing. You know, I came up through art school. And then to succeed at that, to succeed as an artist, takes almost an insane amount of dedication and, and belief in yourself. And I, 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 by insane, I mean just, you know, the average person um, might find it difficult to muster that much self-confidence to be someone who is putting their entire livelihood into their art. Now. Knife making is not strictly art because knives have a purpose. They have the purpose. They are the original tool. You can basically do anything with them, uh, you know, in essence. Uh, it's, so being a knife maker is a little bit different than being an artist because you have something real to sell. As an artist, you only have, uh, you know, your vision to sell and people have to resonate with that vision in a pure and abstract way. You know, you can hand me a knife that I think is ugly and I can still use it. But, you know, you show me a, a, a painting that doesn't resonate with me and you, you may as well use it as Tinder. But doesn't that get into this question or this debate about form versus function and people collect for two different reasons? So can't you, as a knife maker, have a vision of a knife and somebody not see that vision and therefore not want to purchase it? Oh, oh yes. Yes, most definitely. Uh, but also, I've also seen in, in myself how your own vision can change how your view of what is um uh, uh in terms of knives what is a good knife has changed the first time this is the perfect example the first time i saw a medford praetorian i laughed you know out loud i lol'd i was like what you know is that come on right really 
you're going to call that a knife. Okay, that's 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 interesting. You know, I like I like uh, when people make bold statements. And uh, flash forward five years, I've just uh, you know I just bought one and it's on the way at no inconsiderable cost. You know, uh, I've had to move some other things that I like to get it, and uh, and that is a a, a stark. Uh, sort of example of how my tastes have changed originally, you know, thinking that it was just a, an attention, you know, an attention getter. Look at this mm-hmm. knife I made. All right. But um, that evolution, we've talked about that here on the podcast. It's that, that evolution of a collection or a collector, regardless of what you're collecting. Um, you know, I had a few things that I collect and it was always about at the beginning, wanting more, wanting a large collection. It doesn't didn't really matter yes. quality. I, I wanted it, and then after I started, it was like, well, I don't want to buy that one because it's not the best quality. I'll wait for the the next one that's better quality that may cost me more. But that's where I'm going. Yeah. So, yeah, it's natural. Yeah, actually, I see what you're getting at. That is uh, that is a continuous process in in my collecting. Very much, I'm I'm still kind of coming out of the headspace of everything that I find appealing to my eye that I see on YouTube that falls within a certain size parameter. I must buy. I must figure out a way to get it so I can have it in hand. But I realize, and it, it takes a little, it's taken me a little bit of uh, uh, thought and discipline to realize this. But it's only because there are no knife stores around here, Jim. If mm. if I could go into a knife store and pick something up and be like, this is cool, but I don't have to own this. I know I'll gotcha. never carry it. Right. Uh, that would resolve some of that for me. But the idea about, you know, I'm seeing a revolution in my collection. I, I just see flippers on the way out for me. I, I, I have a few that I love uh, that I will not get rid of. But on the whole, flippers and bearings even are on the way out for me. To me, they're, um, they were an interesting side path for me. and uh, um, And I'm not saying wholesale across the board but i just know in terms of where my tastes really lie across large spans of time i like things that are more hard use tactical um uh, phosphor bronze thumb study kind of stuff and uh it's not because my use demands that it's not because i've been out in the field and those bearings have have uh, seized up in the moment of truth because uh, some grit got in there it's none none of that I could see how that could be the case for for an operator, you know, so to speak. But uh, for me, it's just a matter of taste. And and uh, I've mentioned it before. And Rob Bixby called me out on using the word, but I am an aesthete. Uh, I like the way things look and feel first. And um, if I know that it's something capable, and if I actually have a use for it, which you know, let's be real, people. I have a I have a knife with just I have a case with just south of 100 knives in it and uh you know real use so maybe three or four of them get real use Mm. and handful of those get carried 20 Uh, 20 percent 30 percent yeah yeah and then they all get carried every once in a while you know Mm. i should bring this one out but now at this point i've been collecting for so long and people have known it for so long that i have knives that i cannot get rid of that i would have gotten rid of uh, if they weren't gifts. Right. If you had bought them, you would get rid of them. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so you're, I, I know I've heard you say this before. So your criteria for not getting rid of a knife? Okay. It has to be, uh, well, gift. Definitely will not get rid of a knife that was a gift. I have a couple of knives like, for instance, uh, well, knives that I've had for over 20 years, like, um, like my um, Emerson Commander at this point or my um, Cold Steel El, El Ombre, you know, I have a couple of knives now at this point. I'm like, why would I get rid of it? I've been toting it around for 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Can't get rid of it. It's like, uh, you know, at, at this point, now this is going to sound overblown, but it's like a family photo. At this point, why would I get rid of it? You know, right. it, it represents a, a time and a place. And, you know, that's another thing. And, and this is something I always associated uh, with making art. I, I can look at anything I've drawn in my whole life. And kind of remember a time and place. Be like, oh, I remember what was going on. I remember who I was dating. I remember the, you know, the shirt I liked best at that time. Whatever it is, it's like a marker in time. And and knives are kind of similar for me. So if a knife has a story, that means you oh, pr- yes. pretty much won't get rid of it or you won't get rid of it. Right. And now everyone's going to roll their eyes at this because it is totally corny. But if I've 
if it's drawn my blood. I don't care. Oh my. I know it's ridiculous. And a lot of them have. <laughs> when, when you open them from the package. Yeah, right. Oh, I better stab myself so I ensure right. I never get rid of this. But you also add personal touches to your knives that I'm assuming also means you don't get rid of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like my um, my hinderers, I've gotten... Uh, you know, remember uh, Josh from Razor Edge? He was one of our guests. Right. He's, uh, he's, he, he does awesome like um, enhancement work on knives, and he'll even reblade knives. And now he's making his own knives. He just put out a video of a, of a uh, fixed blade knife that he's producing. Uh, but I, I sent a knife that I love from Ohio knife maker, Rick Hinderer. I love Hinderer knives, and I love that he's from Ohio because that's where I come from. And uh, I had the... Um, the old Spanto XM18 that was like a pry bar. I sent it to Josh. He turned it into a, a straight razor and I put a different micarta scale on it. Now I'll never get rid of that knife. You know, there's no reason for it. Why would I, why would I do that? You know, Josh just took an amazing knife and perfected it. So, so if you maybe using the coronavirus as a good example. So if things went from bad to worse oh. and you had to get rid of knives would these untouchables become touchable? Okay, Jim. So don't think I haven't thought about this. <laughs> okay, uh, you might not know this about me. I know you know this, Jim. But I went through a, I went through a highly protective phase after my first daughter was born. Uh, some might say, like my wife, a paranoid phase. But uh, it, you know, I was spending a lot of time considering various conspiracy theories and and con considering how extremely screwed we were and um i started a policy of acquiring knives that i wouldn't get rid of in case in the future i had to trade knives for food or or anything mm -hmm. like that on the okay. open barter market of the post-apocalyptic world so um the thought <laughs> the thought was these these knives here will be um ones i i will get rid of last because they mean that much to me and then I'll go to Walmart, I'll, I'll buy a bunch of $1 knives over at the camping section, and those will be like my my throwaway knives, my giveaway goodwill knives. And then I'll have a, a second tier of knives in my collection that I like, but that I might have to trade, you know. Mm. For, for. So th this, is the, this is the kind of uh, multi-tiered underwater four-dimensional chess I was playing to justify buying all these knives. Uh, I've heard that word a lot on the podcast, justification <laughs> for knives. You got to have them. You have to be well armed with them if you expect to collect something that, uh, you know, it's kind of like collecting crystal penguins at a certain point. It's like, well, you know, what are you going to do with them? Well, well, you, well you need a hundred more. Yeah. <laughs> so do you what were a couple of the knives that you bought for this post apocalyptic meltdown that you would have on hand to trade for food? Well, do you, uh, do you remember? So when you go to Walmart, Jim. If you go to the camping section, you'll find Ozark Trail knives. They're very inexpensive, but then they have a tier below their inexpensive knives that are that, that are just, you know, they're knife-like objects. And they were two dollars. And there was a time where I bought a whole bunch of them, and they're in a box in my in the attic. And the idea was those were going to be the ones that I give away first. Okay. Uh, but but in terms of post-apocalyptic, I, I, I figure anything sharp and blady will work for most people. Mm. You know, and then I've made an, a, a bunch of them. I can give those away too, so I don't have to give away my Emersons. All right. So uh, transitioning from that, you're talking about buying knives for the future if case you need to survive or, you know, yeah. hopefully knock on wood a uh, an unrealistic thing that will happen. But what about buying these knives as investments or collectibles to resell for profit later? Is that a real thing for you or the knife community? Uh, it is a real thing for the knife community. It's not much of a real thing for me because when I get a knife, even if it's one that uh, uh, even if it's one that I don't think I'm going to carry a lot, I still like to carry them initially, and. Uh, I, I don't like to worry about brushing up against things with the pocket clip and, um, you know, generally my knives stay in pretty good shape because they don't see much actual hard use or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But the idea, if you're going to see a knife as an investment, uh, first of all, I'd say there are probably much better ways to invest your money and to make money. 
But if you're going to do that with knives with your hobby, you kind of have to keep them extremely pristine. And you also have to hope that the box comes to you in great shape. I feel like you might not get the full experience from the knife if you don't allow yourself to carry it. So for me personally, no. And and it's an interesting question you raise right now because a knife that I want to get rid of or that I've been thinking of getting rid of to help fund the Praetorian is something that um, I've been on the fence about for a while. And so I've been carrying it the last few days. It's my, my Riot Crossroads, by the way. Mm, okay. And uh, I got that one from Epic Snuggle Bunny. And uh, I've been carrying it. And, and, and of course, the moment you want to get rid of it, it's like, it's like when you decide to get a haircut. On that day, your hair looks awesome. It's the same thing with this. It's like now that I'm, I'm like, I, I could probably get a decent penny for this. Mm -hmm. And I don't carry it, but I love it. But I don't really carry it, but I love it. And I can get good money for it. So I'll carry it for a few days and fall back in love with it. That's what's happening. So when you're using knives as an investment, you have to stay detached. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to get more than what you paid for it, first of all, you have to be Johnny on the spot with uh, exclusive drops and stuff like that. So when or sprint runs, when Spider com comes out with a sprint run of one of their knives and some coveted steel, you got to be ready to snap a few up. And then you all, you also have to be ready to turn them over quickly, you know, while there's still a, a a hot desire for them. And thirdly, you have to probably put up with the with the side eye from a lot of the knife community. A lot of people bristle at that kind of behavior. You know, there's mm. something coming out that that a lot of people are excited, genuinely excited about, but some dude, you know, who <laughs> who's home all day waiting for the drop on the website, hit and refresh snaps up a bunch of them and is now selling them at a premium. And a lot of people look sideways at that. So, hmm. you know, like I said, if you want to be quote unquote ruthless and you want to make money uh, on things that are, that are uh, really desired by a wide community, knives are probably not the, not the savviest place to look. Hmm. Okay. Um, I know I've heard this story um, with your brother Vic on the podcast. I think I looked it up. That was episode number 74. Mm -hmm. We had your brother on and uh, told stories. I remember a yeah. fascinating story about hand grenades. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, uh, if our listeners didn't catch that one, I would encourage you to go back to knifejunkie.com slash 74. But there was a knife that he had that you coveted, that you really wanted. Was Was that the impetus for your your knife collecting interest man i it, it, i really think so it, and it wasn't even a real knife i mean we're talking you know we were probably my daughter's age you know we were very young i was four years younger than he was and he had this toy and you, and you still are oh yes <laughs> that's right and i still am. see you're always so much better at math he had this uh, play bowie knife and it was it was awesome it had a black plastic handle i can still see it i can still feel it in my hand you know you can conjure up uh, sensations like that but um it had a clip point blade it was probably about a, a seven inch blade and uh, it was plastic and uh I i've never seen one like it before or since and this thing was un i was not allowed to touch it okay my brother would not. I mean, he. It was one of those things. I see. I see this dynamic play out with my girls. It's just like I see how much you want this, and I'm not gonna let you have it. This is my knife, and and I would I would sneak it. I would try and and no, nope, wasn't you know. My brother would find out. He'd freak. And I I love him. He's a generous, awesome guy. But with that knife, man, he was very guarded. So my mom saw this dynamic playing out, and she thought, you know, well, I don't want this to you know turn into Cain and Abel. So uh, I'll get Bob his own plastic knife. And God love her. She got me a plastic knife for what is it, Christmas or birthday. And it was cool. And I can still remember that, too. It was a clip point, And it, it looked like uh, an Air Force survival knife, if you're familiar with the Ontario stacked leather handle hex, hex pommel uh, clip point bladed knife. It looked just like that uh, in Toyver. And we're talking the 70s here. And I should have been happy to have that, but it was not my brother's knife. And yeah, I kept it and I used it, but only begrudgingly because mm. Vic Vic had this awesome Bowie. Set up a whole lifetime of love for the Bowie. Was it just because it was his? Or what was it about that toy knife that really set you off? Uh, honestly, I think it was the size. It was big. And, you know, at the time, Grizzly Adams was on TV and oh, Daniel yeah. Boone was on, you know, all in, in rerun. But still... Um, 
and and all the real manly men, you know, G.I. Joe included, uh, the 11 inch version, by the way, uh, carried a knife on their hip. If you're a man, you carry a knife on your hip and uh, you, that that knife might be used to 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 uh, start a fire, might be used to cut a uh, cut a bar, kill, kill a bear or to get in a fight, you know, if you run out of ammunition. So, you know, a man carries a knife and and Vic's knife was bigger and I wanted it. Damn it. Well, maybe uh, we'll be on the quest to help you find that toy knife that will uh, that you could get one day. You know, there's a there's one that t- this conversation is is making me think of that is on my dresser, and it it's a uh, it was my grandfather, my mom's father's knife, and he was an outdoorsman and a, a carpenter and a and a I mean, he could build anything. He was a Renaissance man. He built his own house, which was fortress like, up in New York, and. Uh, he had a knife that I now have, but it was in his workshop. He had the perfect workshop. It was beautiful. It had every single tool known to man, all neatly organized, and uh, and he had you know bushels of wood, and he could make you anything on the spot. Anyway, he had a knife hanging in his uh, right by the door in his shop, and it was a I think it's a marbles. I have to look at it again. It was made in New York, uh, only in New York, and it's a skinning knife with a stacked leather handle and it's old it, and it says on the side uh his last name which was Tignorelli and then it says 1937 and uh you know carved it kind of etched in the leather sheath and this knife uh is a it's a skinner and it has a scimitar like a swept blade it's really cool only about 4 inches long or so and and I keep it as a representation of my grandfather on my on my dresser but there's a, a little mythology behind this. He told me once that he skinned a bear with it, but I, I didn't know what skinning meant, so I thought he right. killed a bear with it. I think uh, he like went toe-to-toe. And uh, even though I'm older now and I know that that's not the case, that's still what that knife means to me. So, right. uh, yeah, it, it's those kind of things that formed, that formed it. A, a love of this stuff. It's you know? interesting how just a, a story, just kind of that memory – attached to a thing. Yeah. You know, can kind of bring it to life, if you will. Yeah. So from this plastic knife, you know, high school, college, where did this progression happen? Where did this kind of come about? Do you, do you remember the first knife you actually bought? Um, well, I remember the first knife I bought that was one hand open and had a clip. And I'll, I'll get to that. In a, please remind me of that in a minute. But All right. uh, through high school, and middle school, I was, uh, you know, I was not the coolest guy, right? And what? Uh, my, <laughs> I know it's crazy. Uh, and uh, friends of mine and I would would have BB gun wars in the woods, and 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 you know we you know we listened to music that that the other kids in our school didn't listen to, and and I got some mall ninja knives. I got into that, but then my good friend Mike, who uh, owns the Broadway Cyclery in Bedford, Ohio, shout out to Mike, showed me. The Cold Steel Tanto. This was 1986 or something like that. And it goes through car doors. And the guy, this guy's in the CIA carried this. And I, like all this mythology behind it. And I'm like, mm. and I had never seen a Tanto before. You know, uh, Lynn Thompson pretty much dusted off and recreated that design for the American market. And I was like, what is this crazy blade? It looks like a samurai. So, so I built this whole mythology around the Cold Steel Tanto. And then when I was a senior in high school or a junior in high school, I bought one. And it was 115 bucks, I remember. And I was like, holy shit, my parents find out they're going to kill me. I spent 115 bucks. But, you know, I had a job at that point. So, yeah, it, it that was the first big knife. And, and, and that thing has been in my bedside table ever since. Still is today. I was going to say, you probably still have that one. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that one's is always close. But the first uh, modern folding knife, you know, uh, with the clip and with the one-handed opening that I bought, I got in 19, uh, 1995 or, or somewhere between somewhere between 1993 and 95. And I was living in Philadelphia and uh, I went out to a mall, the King of Prussia Mall, and there was a knife store there. And I saw it was a Fury knife. I don't know if anyone remembers this brand, Fury. It was Japanese and uh, it was cool. It, it, it had a, a very high – it looked like a Persian blade swept – it had full, fully serrated blade, had a thumb stud, and it was uh, tip down only. And I carried it on my belt, uh, so I had the the body of the blade under the belt and the clip running over it. And uh, I was an early adopter, man. 
1993 through five, I was walking around with a knife all the time. This fury was so cool. And I ended up giving it to my cousin, Tony. So I think uh, Tony still, hopefully he still has it. Hopefully. That's a bit of history right there. So was that, was that uh, to use or just to show? Like, hey, look at my knife on my hip. That was, well, that's, uh, you know, I had, I had just started martial arts, so that was to use, you know, in combat, on the streets. All the those many knife fights Philly. you get in. Yeah. Thank the heavens. Uh, nothing ever happened to me on the mean streets of Philly because, uh, you know, you wouldn't be talking to me right now. <laughs> how, how did you go from that to this massive collection? Is it just something you were, you, you saw in a knife magazine or saw online in later years and just it just kind of crept up on you and kept growing and growing? You know what it was? Jim, it was YouTube. It was YouTube that did it to me. Oh, yeah, damn, yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, by the way, that voice was uh, from Chinatown, the movie Chinatown. That was a specific character I was imitating, not just anyone from Oklahoma. But anyway, so uh, it was uh, years that I was just sort of in dribs and drabs, getting getting knives coming in, and then the internet came along, and I discovered Emerson, and I bought one of those, and bought a couple of Cold Steels online. But it was. It was around 2000, well, it was 2008 when I discovered nothing, nothing fancy on YouTube. And uh, he, nothing fancy in his videos and uh, not just his analysis, which is, which is good. And, it, and at that point, it was like the only person I had ever seen uh, break down and review a knife. It wasn't just the information he was passing along, but it was the actually sitting there and staring at the knife being manipulated in his hands for 10 minutes. At that point, you could only post 10 minutes on YouTube. That was a big seller. I'm a very visual guy. I'm like, God, I'm looking at this knife for 10 minutes. I got to have it. You know, I got it. So that really, it was YouTube and those nothing fancy videos at first. And then, and then I branched out from there. But it was watching other people talking about knives and reviewing knives and holding them and opening them and hearing them and the whole uh, sensory experience. Uh, online that that really got me hooked mm. you know and then and then the ease of internet buying jim oh. right right makes it so easy one click and yeah and and if you have <laughs> you know there uh, this now that i'm a responsible adult i can't do this but there would be times where i'd be like hmm now that i have a couple of drinks in me maybe i should look at knife center oh that's a dangerous combination <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so easy to hit Hit submit and then go, oh, no, I didn't mean that. Uh, psh, it's on the way now. Right. Nothing I can do about it. Might as well <laughs> keep it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the knife porn, if you will, mm -hmm. on YouTube, does that go back again to not having a knife store you could go visit and actually feel it and see it and get that sensory feeling? Yeah, I do. I, th I think that's a big part of it. I, I really do. Uh, for a while, my attitude, it was un un it was unconscious, but my attitude was like, this is the DeMarco uh, Museum of Knives, and I have, must have representation of all designers and all makes and all types and lock designs and blade shapes and this and that. And, you know, it's for posterity. Like, that would be part of my, again, justification for buying it. Well, I don't have any worn cliffs that are multi, you know, that are compound ground and a titanium frame with this steel. So I better get this. That's right. Uh, <laughs> luckily, that sort of super acquisitive point of view has, has begun to melt away. And I'm really focusing on what I like and, and realizing I don't have to buy it. I don't have to own it or even touch it and feel it to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I almost bought the CJRB. That's Best Tech's, uh, Best Tech's budget line. I, there's a knife that has a really cool blade shape, but I know it's too small. I'd never carry it. And it's just not in the premium setup I want. I know I'd never carry it. I almost bought it. I stopped myself. Jim, discipline equals freedom, as Jocko Willing says. And you know, that discipline to not buy that knife, put those funds in another fund to buy something better. Well, I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being tongue in cheek here, but yeah, it, it, it's something that can get out of control. And, right. you know, I bet I bet it does from time to time for people. I'm sure it does. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with collecting and, you know, spending your money as long as you're uh, not neglecting yourself or your family needs and those kind of things. You know, you got to kind of put a fine line on that collection. You mentioned blade length, and, and I know some folks have heard some of these things before in past podcasts, but I, I want to kind of put it together right here in one uh, one synopsis, if you will, one mm -hmm. capsule. What is your ideal for collecting blade length, handle material, knife blade style, etc.? What What is... 
okay. your, your collection collection. So my this this would be the ultimate knife. Uh, forget the design, forget the maker or make. Titanium frame lock with uh, micarta on the show side. A three and a half to four inch blade, but preferably way up towards the four inch side. I love S thirty five VN for its ease and and uh, uh, for the ease of sharpening and 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 that kind of thing. And a uh, you know. A, a, a nice clip, but really for me, it's, it's, I, I am becoming, uh, not a, necessarily a material snob, but I know that I really like titanium. I really mm-hmm. like titanium frame locks, not just because that's what the finest knives are made of, but, but because I just really like that format. I love the material of titanium, mm-hmm. but I also love my, my Carta. And if I'm going to carry it, it's got to be three and a half or over it. That's just a taste thing. I, I can't explain it. Is there an upper limit on what you would carry? So it has to be over three and a half, but. Uh, okay. Uh, I never carry my seven and a half inch folding uh, uh, XL Espada. That is a gigantic knife. But uh, I've carried six inch, uh, the six inch uh, cold steel knives and, and can easily carry the five and a half inch folding cold steel so no i have no upper end Hmm. and uh if if it were friendlier you know if if it were more legally accepted i'd I'd walk around with insane stuff i mean because you know not because i feel i need it but just because i like it you know and and just because you could yes and you know a a women a woman on any day can pick a beautiful scarf that she thinks you know enhances her neckline or what have you or her outfit and can go out with it well you know Maybe someday there will be a time where a man can be like, I think I'll just put on this eight and a half inch Bowie blade because it really complements this plaid I'm wearing today. Or it goes with my boots. Yeah, it goes with my boots. And my belt buckle. Around. Yeah. Accessorize yeah. with a knife. You know what I'm talking about. So accessorize with a knife, pocket jewelry versus what a knife is made for. Where, yeah. where, where, where do you kind of stand on that uh, form versus function kind of thing? All right, Jim. Well, uh, this is this is exactly where my mind is right now because I have gotten rid of much of my pocket jewelry and it's hard to do because and and I'll define it for me my pocket jewelry for instance I just got rid of uh, just sold off my Wii six oh nine it was a a giant four inch purple worn cliff purple and black worn cliff beautiful beautifully constructed everything about it great. But just a little bit frivolous, you know, and, and, and I realize that, uh, you know, my, my, my knife collecting in and of itself is just a little bit frivolous. However, with my tastes, it's, it's, I like that more combat y thing. So the purple knife had to go. Never got carried. It got, it got a nice sum for it to put towards something a little bit more in my, in my wheelhouse. So yeah, the pocket jewelry is, uh, is, is, Almost all gone from my collection. Uh, I am keeping now. Now I have a couple of borderline pocket jewelry knives. I would say that the Todd knife and tool malware uh, made by Best Tech and the and the Roxy Four made by Wee, both very serious knives. You could use them tactically, you know, all day long. However, their designs are so designy and futuristic that they they do veer into the pocket jewelry realm. But I'm not going to get rid of them because they have a sentimental value, but B, they flex enough into the, uh, you know, a space age Viking weapon realm mm. that uh, that they still have a place in my collection. Kind of scratch both it both itches for you that uh, functional tactical as well as the the beauty and the the style, if you will. Exactly, without going full pocket jewelry. Now, okay. I, I have to make one caveat to this, Jim, which is uh, the realm of customs. I know I frequently bust on. Um, the aesthetic of a lot of customs where you have complex materials, complex visual pattern materials like carbon fibers next to Mokutai, next to Damascus steel, you get all these patterns. I call it the Mr. Furley effect. If you remember Mr. Furley from Three's Company, uh, you know, he always had a, a plaid tie and a polka dot shirt and another plaid pants. And he just had crazy patterns. And that's what I think of when I see a lot of custom knives. However, there are some incarnations of those kind of Mr. Furley knives that I love. You put a Damascus blade next to, um, you know, a titanium bolster next to a, a beautiful uh, um, 
ivory or not ivory, um, what do you call it? Stag, natural materials mixed with these other kind of alloys. I do find that very appealing. So for me, pocket jewelry will come back into the collection, but it will be mm. when I'm getting an RJ Martin custom mm. or it'll be when I'm getting a some sort of like fancy, fancy custom knife, <laughs> you know, by a maker that I like. Gotcha. Okay. Last couple of minutes, we're going to kind of wrap it up here. I'm not going to do a speed round like you normally do, but we'll uh, we'll try to get some uh, shorter answers, more concise answers as we go through these. And I'm going to put you on the on the spot here with a couple of questions that honestly okay. just kind of come to mind as I'm thinking about it. I've been thinking about this one. I know this one's maybe going to get you into trouble. <laughs> uh, favorite knife manufacturer, favorite company. Mm. And you could go top three or if you wanted to. Okay. Uh, give me, give me a second. You know, we are on the clock here, Bob. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I, well, okay. I got to be 100% honest. The Emerson Cold Steel ZT. So, I mean, you said I could, I could do it like that. So I'll do it like that. If I, if I have to bring it down to one, and and this includes not just their product, but their their mythos and and the people behind it, I'd say Emerson. All right. So favorite blade style shape. Uh, the Bowie, 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 and the Warren Cliff. Okay. So Bowie, Bowie first, Warren Cliff second. I like the Bowie for its utility, and I like the fact that it's American. Okay, sorry. Um, um, uh, that's American, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes, fills me with pride. Go ahead. Least favorite. Uh, a um, a uh, sheep's foot. Even though I like them on a on a um, on a slip joint, a sheep's foot has no stabby potential. Knife has to have mm. stabby potential to me. Okay, so that's a knife junkie criteria, the stabby, stabby yes, function. Yes, must be able to thrust as well as slash. Okay, and does that relate to the martial arts? Yeah, to me. And and there's plenty of stuff you can do without thrusting, but I it when I'm when I'm when I'm doing my shadow boxing with a knife, I'm always thrusting. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh you've you've answered the the former function question. We've gotten into that before. Uh and you've talked about fixed blades and folders, but Right now, fixed or folder? Right now, folder. I just, I'm fascinated, I'm fascinated by them. Even though if I had to just pick one for the rest of my life, it would be a, it would be a fixed blade. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, and maybe you already answered this uh, with the Emerson knife. Would, would that be as you ans ask in your speed round, your desert island knife? Um. So yeah, my my. Okay. Can we do a desert island folder and a desert island fixed blade? Hey, it's your show. I'll allow it. <laughs> All right. So my, my desert island fixed blade, uh, with the information I have right now, with the knives I've experienced, would be my Cold Steel Trailmaster Bowie. That thing is just gnarly and will handle anything. Uh, and it's old. Mine is over 20 years old. I, I don't even know what it's made out of, but it kicks ass. Um, and then the... <sighs> Okay. Okay. I'm getting there. You see uh, how tough this is when you ask yes. people this question? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess I would say my Emerson Commander because it was kind of the one that started it all, um, the high-end buying. Biggest regret about a knife you did not buy? Um, knife you wish you had bought when it came out. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I do wish, uh, oh, okay. Uh, this is going to sound funny to you. Uh, but, uh, there are a couple of cold steels that I, I kind of wish I got when they came out. The twist master. I don't know if you know what this is. Mm -hmm. It's like their version of an open L it's like an open L on cold steel steroids. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really wish I got that when it came out. I know you can find them now, but they're, they're money I don't want to spend on a Cold Steel Twistmaster. Yeah, love that knife. There's, well, there's one other. It's the Bushmaster, the Cold Steel Big Bowie Bushmaster. They don't make them anymore either. Darn. All yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll twist that around. Biggest regret of a knife you did buy. You're like, you bought it and you went, oh, why'd I buy this? Was it one of those you, you bought when you had a couple of drinks of whiskey? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of that way with the with the zero tolerance zero zero five five, the Gus Ciccini, the SLT, the one that I say looks like a stealth fighter. It's cool, and I and I've tried to sell it so many times, but it's so it's cool, and I like it, and I'm like, I guess I'm glad I have this. 
but I didn't need to spend that money. You know, it was one of those things where uh, it was discontinued and it was like, oh, my God, I better get this or I'll never have the opportunity again. That's right. me, let me tell you, everybody, when ZT discontinues something, that only means they're coming out with a different configuration of it. You'll be able to get it in blue and black or in mm. tiger stripe or something. So don't don't sweat it <laughs> like I did. Good advice from the knife junkie. What's something I haven't asked you, Bob? Something you were prepared for me to ask or oh. that I didn't ask you or maybe just something that we haven't talked about in 100 episodes of the Knife Junkie podcast that you think would be interesting for our listeners to know? Well, I, I, I would like to say this, and uh, this is uh, – uh, I know I, I bring it up in passing, and I, and I make it seem like it doesn't mean much to me, but I do design and draw – knives a lot and i and and then i make them out of steel and i have them he professionally heat treated and I, so i slowly produce knives and i draw them and and i make it seem like uh, it doesn't mean much to me but it does and, and every time i finish a knife um it makes me feel uh great and i i'm gonna say it right here i at some point want tops to make one of my my designs or you know i i want to have something mass produced that i've created because you know i uh like this one knife that i carry with me all the time i call it the liberator <laughs> it's kind of a lofty name but it's a great fixed blade knife it's it's very capable four and a half inch bowie that stashes on your person very easily and i think uh i think it could have a life outside of my own pants uh, Ooh, that sounds terrible. That but, does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so maybe people don't know this about me, but I do actually take the drawing, uh, the designing, and the and the making when I have a chance to making to make these knives. I do take it seriously. I love it. I love the way it feels when I'm actually working on them, and they're imperfect. And um, I don't spend nearly enough time to make them as good as the knives of the people I'm talking to. But right. I am inspired to keep trying. And uh, so maybe in the future, you'll see more of this stuff uh, come out for me. And finally, what can we look forward to, Bob, in the next 100 episodes of the Knife Junkie podcast or future episodes of uh, Thursday Night Knives? What's what's in store for the Knife Junkie? Well, I, I would like to continue to I mean, I have a still have a roster of of designers, both legendary and up and coming that I want to talk to. And so that's kind of a constant thing. I'm, I'm constantly reaching out to people and scheduling and doing all that. So you'll see more great. You'll see and hear more great interviews with Thursday night knives. I would like to start bringing some of the people I'm talking to in on the action. Um, we've, we've done this a little bit. Slicey dicey came on. Alex is a Alex Tissot of Alex's knife box is a regular contributor. Uh, as is Zell. He's a regular co-host. Um, these guys are great. I would love to have them and then bring in an Ernest Emerson or bring in, uh, an Aaron Goff or, or whomever to, to have it a little less formal, but they're with us and we can ask them questions and it can be kind of interviewee, but it's also kind of a hang, hang out for 15 minutes with, uh, Ernest Emerson on, on Thursday night knives. He'll be joining us from nine fifteen to, you know, something like that. Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm looking forward to in the next year. All right. So a lot of great plans ahead for the Knife Junkie podcast and Thursday Night Knives with Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Bob, uh, thanks for letting me interview you on your podcast, man. It's been, uh, it's hey. been fun. Learned a little bit more about you, even the, the, though we've been friends for years. <laughs> the pleasure is mine, Jim. And it's, uh, of course, it's an honor to be interviewed by you. And uh, uh, and then just to, just to sit and talk about myself to people who are listening, uh, it's an honor if you've listened this long. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I want to remind you that uh, Bob is uh, giving away a cold steel broken skull, not a pink one, but it'll also have the snaggle tooth and that uh, uh, winner will be announced next Sunday on this episode, the interview episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. All you have to do is send Bob an email at bob at the knife dot com. Enter episode 100 in the subject line. And you'll be entered into a random number generator drawing to uh, to win that knife all in celebration of the Knife Junkies 100th episode. Bob, uh, final word, final thoughts, final takeaway from the interview, if you will. That's one of the questions I always ask you for your <laughs> other interviews. Well, uh, I, I have to say, like, I'm just just in reflecting over the experience of doing these 100 episodes so far, it, it has been a real uh 
growth experience for me. I mean, it's pushed me out of my comfort zone in a lot of ways. And, and you, Jim, have, have been instrumental in that. And I, I very much appreciate that and all the work you've done on this show to make it sound awesome and professional. And, uh, and, uh, it's just been uh, such an awesome experience. And, uh, and, uh, you know, you and I have had a working relationship going into this, but our relationship has deepened so much from doing this podcast. And I also feel like you're, knowledge and 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 interest in knives has deepened beyond mm. just the resale value or that or the right, right. The, the interest that you came into it and uh i just feel like um i've met a lot of great people listeners uh and and so i'm just grateful and happy for this opportunity and i thank you jim man for for making it happen not a problem thank you bob for uh, spreading your knowledge and sharing the uh, wealth of information you have uh, about knives with uh, Knife junkies and knife newbies like myself, and uh, we will continue this uh, knife junkie podcast train as long as we can. Uh, <laughs> that's the knife junkie podcast at uh, the knife junkie.com. Subscribe on your favorite uh, podcast app, or you can also catch the shows on YouTube at uh, the knife junkie.com slash YouTube. We put up the uh, podcast on YouTube there so you can uh, air quote watch while you work or do some other things. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to say, uh, if I haven't yet, thank you to everybody who listens to who actually spends the time on this podcast. Uh, it's because of you that we keep doing it. And uh, it's such a pleasure meeting you when you when you email me and stuff like that. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who listens to this podcast. Can't say anything better than that. And I'll just echo that. Thanks. Thanks for being with us. Episode number 100 of the Knife Junkie podcast. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie person. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.